Ashwagandha Ashwagandha Chamomile Echinacea
Ginkgo. Ginseng. Lavender. Turmeric.
So this is not good. All right. Um, what another thing is is that the Bible is telling us right here in 2 Timothy 3:16 that the word of God is God breathed. That means that the breath of life, God has breathed the breath of life into people. Okay, so when he created Adam. He breathed life into Adam. Okay, so when you breathe, your breath, the breathing that you have come from God. Whether or not you want to appreciate the blessings that God has given you, it, it starts just with the breath. So God has given, <coughs> God has given you the breath of life. So if man was to have created a uh, 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 try to mimic a creation of a human, it probably would be dysfunctional. Like when you look at the AI robots, the AI robots, they are basically in like human form now. They're so advanced. They can even run the track. Okay. And so you have these AI robots that are, um, that have the possibility of malfunctioning. So technology malfunctions, but God's God creation does not. So when you have these sort of hybrid humans, you have the possibility of omissions of error. And see, God doesn't, God doesn't have any omissions of error. And I, I'm saying omissions of error. Okay, I, I want to sound as clear as possible so that you're not um no no one is misinterpreting what I'm saying. Okay. So God does not have any omissions of error. And actually, what he what God was telling me earlier, because I have like times where I meditate. And what I mean by meditate is I like to be silent. And when I'm silent. I it just invite God to fill me, my entire body with the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit answers you, it answers in your belly. So you invite the Holy Spirit in and you just lay and relax and you meditate. You close your eyes and you just be quiet and you invite God into your heart and you say, God, I just want to hear your voice only. Your voice only right now, God. I just want to hear your voice and you just lay there and listen. Just, uh, it's, it's like some people, they do yoga, right? Or they get, um, they go and they get acupuncture. Now, um, I have always been kind of fascinated with acupuncture because you have all of these different, um, needles that provide some like that relaxation. And it's, that's like a different form of meditation. It actually helps with, um, inflammation and different, things uh different stress levels like what has been learned um oh, i'm sorry what i'm trying to explain this the right way so what was um it was research that was done was that people that when they're getting um their muscles relaxed like the tension out of their body you know it is it's causing like uh hormone changes in their body okay so acupuncture is a nut, is a way to meditate. Some people really f find it fascinating to get acupuncture and meditate during when they're getting it done. Um, yoga. Yoga is another form of uh, meditation for some people in this world, okay? They find um, that using yoga allows them to free their mind. But see, when you free your mind, what happens is you're allowing other spirits to enter your mind because you're now you're not protected and with the, the holy spirit so you have spirits that are roaming the earth so like that's the issue because i used to think it was it was nice uh just the actual stance that people take when they're meditating the reasons why they meditate in yoga and they free their mind um, so they, they think that they're freeing their mind, but they're actually 
They are freeing their mind. They're inviting evil to come and enter into their thoughts and then their mind. Because so you have to remain protected by the blood. So if the devil goes to and from the earth, thinking, seeking whom he may devour, what does that tell you? That tells you that the devil and his demons are roaming the earth. Okay. So if you are, if you are freeing your mind with spirits, you're, fr you're free spirited, right? But listen to the word, the free spirited. That, how, how does that make sense? Okay. Free spirit. You know, you have a free spirit for any spirit to come and influence you. Okay. So, um, so that's that. So I'm, I'm going to uh, resurface back on what the word of God says. So the scripture is God breathed. It is not, it has no omissions of error. So you have all of these different authors. You have about 40 different authors in, in the word of God that was all written in different time spans, like different generations. So the Old Testament to the New Testament is the silent period, which my pastor said the other day, uh, what was it? Uh, the institutionary, okay? I think I remember this, but I don't want to give you misinformation. I think it's called the institutionary institutionary atonement that's what it's called yes ha I think i got it let me look that up okay so we have um the institutionary atonement because see you have most you have multiple names for this okay so no 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 it's called substitutionary atonement yes okay so we look that at when Jesus died, it was his death was a substitution for sinners. So the scripture, the scriptures teach us that all men are sinners. And the scripture tells us this in Romans 3, 9 and 18, and in Romans uh 3 uh 23. So um the penalty for our sin, sin it was death. So we were made dead. We were dead. Okay, we were spiritually dead. Okay, so we were spiritually dead until Jesus Christ made atonement. So he was the substitution in place of that death. Because by nature, everyone was sinful. So the wage of sin was death. So we were dead with sin spiritually and so when jesus christ died on the cross and he he bore the cross he took the weight of our sin because he was blameless even though other religious uh call him a prophet but then they they claim that their uh leader or um like muhammad is um compared to jesus there is no way you can compare muhammad to jesus christ Absolutely not. Muhammad admitted to being sin. And the Quran was written 600 years after the Bible, mimicking or trying to mirror the exact same things in the Holy Bible. Saying that men was created from a blood clot. What angel was that talking to Muhammad? Because see, the devil can appear as an angel of light. Be sure not to be deceived. So we're going to talk about the blameless Lord, our God, Jesus Christ. He manifested himself into the flesh. He was 100% God and 100% man. Okay, so his, his, our sin equated to death. And in place of death, he was the substitution. So he has substitutionary atonement. Why? Because now we got life spiritually. Okay. So we have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So this teaches us a lot of different things here. Okay. So now we look at the Bible and we say that all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness. 
I want to dive in a little deep with this too, right? Because when you think about rebuking, okay, what is rebuking? Well, let's look up rebuking. So rebuking, okay, re meaning of rebuking. Oh, that's what I meant to say. So the other day on Friday, I know I had touched base with a lot of different things um, when it came to the herbal medicine. But I hope, well, I pray that you were able to hear more context to what I was saying than just paying attention to me yelling. Because it had a lot of meaning to that. And I was actually being intentional. Okay? I am very intentional. If you haven't noticed, I'm a very intentional type of person. Okay. So all scripture is God breathed and is useful for useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So what does this mean? When you're rebuking something, okay, uh, rebuking is a transitive verb. You have to criticize sharply. You reprimand. Right? You rebuke it. It flee. You flee. So let's look at what it, what uh, rebuking means in the strong concordance. I should have had, already had this up. So we're going to look up what the word rebuking is. Oops, that's not the strong concordance. I should be going to the strong concordance. Why is it not going to the strong? Okay. okay, so let me go to rebuking. So rebuking means, I know that I think it means to flee. Okay. So we're going to look in um, this verse, Luke 4 and 41. So let me look at the um, Luke. Is This will be the Greek. I don't even see the Greek. I only see, I only see the uh Hebrew. The Hebrew is Ara uh Guawo. Uh, it's the, the Hebrew number 1606. It just means rebuke and reproof. But I was trying to look at the actual word from in Greek because and I don't see it though. Okay, let me so basically you're gonna reproof, okay. You rebuke. And that's what you're supposed to do, to criticize. That's what you should be. At. You should have self-scrutiny on yourself. And what do I mean by self-scrutiny? Let me tell you like this. This is what uh, self-scrutiny is. Self-scrutiny is being reflexive. Can you, do you know how to be reflexive? Okay, because you want you want to pay attention to what you're doing that is wrong. You want to, of course, you want to pay attention to the good things too. You know, you um, but the good things are going to be good, right? So you want to place emphasis on the things you need to improve. Okay, so this is the way that I do that. I say, okay, so tell me five things that you know that you need to change. Five things. So think of five things that you know you do right. Okay. So you have these uh, five things that you know that is wrong, right? How do you work on correcting it? Okay. So let's think about this here. You want to make sure that you can identify you. If you don't, the problem, you have to be able to be transparent. Don't fool yourself. Do not fool yourself. Do not lie to yourself. Because... If you deny the things that you need to change, who, who is going to help you? 
You and you have to be able to be honest with yourself. So you have to be honest. So we, I'm not gonna go through these common um beliefs that you should have. Okay, we're gonna. I'm going to assume that I'm talking to a mature audience that knows how to identify issues that are in their life where you can change. So rebuking. So we're gonna discuss this here. Um, what is uh? Well, I, I'm sorry. One one second. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay. So basically, can you accept rebuking? Well, I'm sorry. Did I say rebuking? Can you accept being rebuked? And can you also accept rebuke embraceful, embrace it? You know, um, if you can accept reproof, means that if you can accept correction, you can accept wisdom. But if you reject embracing uh correction, you are rejecting wisdom. And you're rejecting intelligence. So let me explain this. So <laughs> yesterday, okay, I'm in class. Now, I thought that last week was the first day we had um, school, but I had mistaken. We did not start last week. We started on the 21st. So uh, yesterday was the first day back to, to class. And I'm sitting in class. And you guys are not going to believe this. Now, my church, now, God is just so good. I can't stop laughing about how, how God does things, okay? My church actually has, like, an accountability team where um, when you are... Uh... <laughs> it's so funny. I don't think... I can't stop laughing because see, I didn't I I know that I'm gonna get an accountability coach from church too. <laughs> and I also I just I just obtained an accountability agent at school. So basically I have someone who texts me every single day and checks on me every morning to figure out what am I going to do? What is my goals for writing? So yesterday was right after class, she, she, uh, she texts me. And so she says, so so she tells me her day and I, I tell her, I say, hey, look, you know, um, this is nice and everything, but I would like for you to only contact me on Friday, Saturday and Sunday and only on Wednesday. <laughs> Because <laughs> I this is so funny because I had <laughs> I felt like I don't need anybody interrupting me and bothering me, you know, like when I'm doing stuff. Because if I'm reading, I'm gonna have to respond. Now you all in my business. What I can tell you what I'm doing. I don't need a coach. Is this now? I just need an accountability person. So just only, I really only wanted her to contact me on the days when I'm working. Okay. And she says, well, I contact, I will contact you every day if that's okay with you. And so I said, well, you could do that by email. <laughs> I said, you have my email. And she says, oh, well, I guess I would have to get used to a new habit. I said, I started laughing. She laughed and I started laughing. I said, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. You know, um, I said, it's okay. It's okay. So just, just inbox me however much you need to. So I noticed just from yesterday and today that I actually do a lot of work. And I was inspired 
by her message this morning, I actually woke up about, oh, I woke up so early. I was up at like six in the morning, seven, but I went to bed kind of late. So let me explain this to you because it actually correlates with what I'm trying to get you all to understand. I did not, I thought I did not need someone to contact me every single day because I'm thinking like, okay, well, I'm, I only do homework on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and on Wednesday. So usually Tuesday night going on into Wednesday, I'm up like really late. And then Wednesday all day, like I'm, I'm doing schoolwork and on the weekend I'm doing schoolwork. This is how I've been for years. Okay. So like Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, I'm off, really. So from doing any type of writing. And um, so with her, she she asked me, so what are what are your writing goals for? Th this is yesterday. So I tell her, I say, uh, I need to work on some of my research. And then I say I'm a review, because I'm a reviewer at the um society for uh, research and community action. It's called SCRI. And so students from all over the world, they submit different proposals for research and scholarships. And I am a reviewer. So I am grading some of those proposals. So um, I've been looking at them during the week. And I'm like, okay, so I, I finished today, but let me explain to you how. So yesterday, I say, well, I have to grade some proposals. I need to do some of my research. And I also have to get my cert my certifications in Oracle done. <laughs> I have to do a lot of writing for that. So like certifications in Oracle is really complicated. If you ever tried to be a software engineer of any kind, okay? Um, it takes a lot of diligence and a lot of work. So yesterday I, I, I had class for... About four and a half hours. Then after that, uh, when she texted me, I told her what I had to do. I worked on the proposals, okay? And then I worked on my the uh, ACM certificate. So I got two of my certificates completed. Now I am certified as an Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Foundations Associate, including the Data Manager Associate. So I obtained two certificates yesterday. Then on Friday, I submitted two grants for my business. And today when she inboxed me, I was like, I felt obligated to finish what, she, what I told her that I was going to do. So it actually created more of accountability on my part. So today when she inboxed me this morning, because I was up really early, but I was really tired. Because I have been doing a lot of reading and writing yesterday. And so I was extremely sleepy. And I missed church today because I, I went to I woke up about six something and then I went to sleep about 10. And I'm like, oh God, I'm just I'm so tired. So I went to sleep and I got up. Uh and so I felt obligated to finish what I told her that I would do. So I told her I needed to finish the proposals. I needed to do some work on my uh, blog for tonight. And I also needed to probe into some articles for my uh, research. So I needed to incorporate some more articles. So now I have not been able to incorporate the other additional articles because I wanted to add maybe like two or three more articles to my uh, research. So I'm going to do that after the podcast. But what I'm saying is that even though I had like a negative perception of having um, someone contact me every day, it kind of placed a lot of accountability on me. Meaning that when I tell her that I'm going to finish something, I am going to do it now. So now it, it actually enables me to make sure that I'm sticking to my schedule. And my writing goals are being accomplished. So I actually like the idea. I At first, I rejected having a accountability agent every single day. But after yesterday and today, I have noticed how much I have accomplished. And so having someone that 
you can like reflect to to make sure that you're accountable for what you say that is the it, it incredible feeling it, it's a tremendous amount of effort just not on my part but on that person to make sure that i'm holding my end of the bargain for my life and my goals so i really appreciate that and for that to be a free service that's incredible so when i talk about rebuking it is like we have to look at self even though you know it's something that it may not be something that you want to do it's okay to try new things that will empower you to become better at what you're currently doing. Because guess what? You know, your perception of things, it may not just be, you know, that may not be right. So you want to make sure that when you accept a uh, reproof, you embrace, you embrace the change. You embrace the fact that, okay, like, I, I feel like I'm doing a lot more than what a lot of people are doing. I don't, but I don't compare myself to nobody because I don't know what nobody else is doing, really. You know, I don't sit on the phone a lot. I don't talk on the phone. Okay, I talk for maybe, I don't talk that long. I, most of the time, when my, my baby's at work, it's quiet in my house. There is no sound. Besides my when I'm praying or praising worship. So that's the thing. And so we have to ex understand that in order to have knowledge, you have to be able to accept correction. Okay, so I at first I, I when my pastor was talking about the accountability, I was just that kind of made me uncomfortable. I'm like, I, I don't need no people that make mistakes all day long trying to help me or direct me they gonna have me start probably doing activities i'm not used to doing because every time i look up somebody doing some activity and i gotta stay focused <laughs> on the things that god want me to do i don't need no distractions and so like you know that's my perception but when god the way god work is this god look at what he just did look at what god just did in my school you know, so yesterday just marked a new way for me to be accountable. So now I have an accountability agent at school. And now guess what? Now I'm more, I'm, I'm more receptive to having one in church now. So now I know that I need to allow the full scope of what God has planned for me to be included in my life. Because if I don't, then I would, I would be led to being stupid. You know, and then that, that will allow me to not be, you know, uh, intelligent, but then I'll be a fool, like in Proverbs 15 and 5, or Proverbs 12 and 1, where you be stupid if we reject the correction that God has for us. So you look at this scripture and you just pass it back. Don't pass it back. Think about what God is saying here. So when God wants us to do better, the scripture is used for, for teaching us, for rebuking us when we need to be corrected, for correcting and training in righteousness. So I need an accountability specialist at church. Okay? So <laughs> that's simple as that. And I am ready. Yes. Okay, I'm ready to you know, take on whatever it is that God wants for me because this is important. So sometimes we have to let go of these pre existing thoughts and beliefs that can prohibit us from moving forward. You know, so I'm not going to say something that uh, I'm not going to say, well, you do this and I haven't tried it or I don't understand what it means. I would not be in this position right now if God did not want me to. I would not be here speaking to you if God did not want me to. So like today, what, what I was saying was prior to before I get, gave that example, when I meditate on the word, God told me that when you praise me, because this is what he said for me to say on the podcast, he said, when you praise me, you acknowledging you acknowledging God and you're saying thank you for all that he's done. 
It's kind of like if somebody you they ask you for ten dollars and you give it to them and they're like, give me ten dollars. And you just gave it to them. And then you ask them, they say, well, give me twenty dollars. But you just gave them ten. And they asking you for more. And then now they like, hey, give me fifty. Give me fifty, give me seventy-five, give me hundred. Right. They ask you all this money. And so then it's like they give it to you, but you you didn't even say thank you. See, that's from that's that's a worldly perception. That's a carnal thinking, right? That's a carnal mind. But that's looking at it from the worldly perspective. You have to understand that God is spiritual. So if worldly people want to be thanked for just minute benign things, well, I think minute, is that an urban word? Because sometimes I'll be, I be uh, saying urban words. <laughs> one time I, I was <laughs> one time I was praying and I said ingenuity and and, and so the <laughs> I said God please let us be let us have genuity and so that the one of the uh the individuals they said well what what is what is genuity what is genuity that's what I said genuity and and I said well, I guess it's an urban word. Why don't you go look it up? You know, so sometimes when you using words with some people, it, it's like they get offended because it's not in the dictionary and stuff like that. So don't be don't be uh deterred or distracted by things that are meaningless. Okay, we we you have to stay focused on the plan of God. So no matter what is going on. You have to keep God in your life and stay focused on what God has planned. I don't know why this recording just messing up like this. Okay, so uh, next. So we have to make sure that we're accepting the word of God, that we're being, that the word of God is teaching us that we can accept and embrace correction. And the word of God is training us up for righteousness. Okay, and no, we're not going to always do things exactly the way God uh has stipulated but that's when you go to the throne of grace and you make sure that you are communicating all of your efforts to God and you explain it to God how much you want to please him and God will guide you so now you have to understand that God is a God is spirit so if worldly people want you to thank them when they've done when you've given them something or they bought you some food. They want to be thanked. Did they have God? We were created in the image of God. That means when you get the Holy Spirit inside of you, you should be doing the things that are God like. Right? So now let's go. Let's talk about my language. So I had somebody to send me a message on LinkedIn last week. That is a, a coach, a personal coach and a business coach. And I was like, oh, well, I don't even understand what I would need a little biz personal coach. I don't need no personal coach. And so when we, I talked to the man, <laughs> this is some of this stuff is so funny. <laughs> I talk, I don't mag, I'm very responsive. So I respond to people if they if you send me a message, I'm gonna try to respond right away. Um, or as soon as I see it. So, and I check my emails just as much as I check my text messages. So my text messages, my emails are just as equally important to my text messages. My I'm sorry, my emails are more are important as my text messages. So when I talk to him. He was just telling me how we could do different things for my branding and stuff like that. Um, but but see, that's the thing. When you think about people wanting to change you, like I said, they will have a whole plan for your life and you don't even know anything about it. So you don't have to be connected to that. Your identity should be in Christ and Christ alone. And what do I mean by your identity? Well, I hope that I do not mess this up. Okay, so ascribed identity. I usually sometimes I, I get them both mixed up, but ascribed identity is what other people, the way you the way you view yourself, 
in with the way others think of you. So it's the understanding that you have for how people, other people view you. And your avowed identity is how you view yourself. So a scribe is how, how you think other people view you. And the scribe, I'm sorry, about is how you view yourself. So if you are, you have identity that is attached to maintaining a socioeconomic status. Why? You don't have to do that. You have, you have to make sure that your goals in life, your motivation for everything that you do is not attached to what other people feel about you or what other people think about you. You let them think whatever they want. And when I mean it, I mean it. Let them think whatever they want. I don't care what your socioeconomic, is, your socioeconomic status is. Let people believe and think whatever it is that they want to believe and think. You cannot attach your identity to that. You cannot attach your accomplishments to that. So I had my uncle, my uncle, he actually called me like, uh, a few weeks ago and he said why you ain't tell me when you graduated so I had got my master's degree back in um in 2020 and I was like well you know I felt well accomplished you know I did <laughs> and then it was during the time of COVID so we were supposed to have our graduation at the Airy Crown Theater because before we had it at the uh, the pavilion, the UIC pavilion in Chicago, it was over 10,000 students. So now they were saying that we were going to have it at like a concert hall. I, I've never in my life been to a concert because I just think it is extremely too many people. And I don't, <laughs> so many. Like, I just want to graduate, give me my degree. Okay, why do we have to be over 20,000 people there? It's just too much. I don't, woo. No. Okay, you get lost in the crowd and how you gonna find your people. Don't nobody, I don't know how to time follow that. Okay. So I just want to get my degree. And at the time, so now we were originally gonna have it at the UIC Pavilion, where 10,000 students. So I went on one, you know, that wasn't the problem. The problem is going to the um airy crown theater which is a concert where where celebrities have concerts and it's gonna be over twenty thousand students because they haven't had a graduation in two years or a year and a half or something like that so i was just like ah, no it just it really didn't even matter to me can you just mail me my degree <laughs> because guess what I felt accomplished. God helped me with my homework. Okay. I went to school nonstop. I felt good. I don't have to go and boast about that. Because guess what? My identity for completing that was to satisfy the desires to helping people. So God know my motive and God know my desires to help people. And that's really important for me. I have a benevolent uh, heart. And so it's important for me to help. And that's why I'm staying in school. My kids, I want to be able to practice what I teach them. And not just tell them something that I can't implement. And now God know my heart. And now he's allowing me to have a podcast to now teach other people about being authentic and um, being able to overcome because I am an overcomer. So when you have cultural norms, right? Everyone has cultural norms. Some people have cultural convergence where they will adapt certain principles within that culture, within that culture, right? So my cultural norm was always kind of like dealing with a lot of different problems. So when it comes to adversity, it's like a norm for me. It's not something that I feel de defeated. So just say if my car break down, I don't feel defeated. If I don't find a mechanic, I don't feel like life stopped 
because I don't have a vehicle. I don't feel like life stopped because I don't have a job or I lost my job. Life doesn't stop. Okay, I've been through so much where it is the norm to be able to overcome. So overcoming, being an overcomer is a norm for me. So any obstacle that try to like uh, overpower my mind or overpower me in a way that um, can cause defeat, I pray. And so it doesn't over, I, it doesn't overcome me. I overcome it. I prevail over my enemies. I triumph over my enemies. Um, I am not defeated. I am an overcomer. So regardless of what, because I have been through so much where God had to like, God has, uh, what is it? God has built me. God helped, uh, God has helped. What do you call, uh, what is that called? I'm trying to pick out the right word. So God has formed me into becoming a uh, overcomer that is, um, I'm able to overcome a lot of things through the Holy Spirit. Okay. So I'm more than a conqueror. There is no word for that because when you're more than a conqueror, you can do all things through Christ. So with the experiences that I've been through, I have been rejected by teachers. They've done things to me. I have endured different things in school with other students. I have endured a lot of family tragedy. Um, I've dealt with, uh, endured a lot of adversity when it comes to racism, discrimination, and disparities. I've dealt with so many different things that it's, it was like a norm. So situations doesn't equate to me giving in or like, oh, it's the end. You know, it's like, oh, okay. Well, I well, I was telling the man, the coach last week, he was like, so what, what do you do to make money? I say, what, what did you say? Good. Like, he sounded like a real sales agent because sales agents, they always ask for the sale so that he's very straightforward and blunt. How do you make money? I was like, well, on my job, but my job is about to end this Friday and um, that's it. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, oh, so what, what are you going to do? I said, well, the only thing I can do is look for another job, right? Okay. So, you know, that's, that's the point. It's like when you know that you lost something, you work on obtaining it. You work on getting it again. So whatever it takes for you to, to get what you need, that means is that whatever it takes for you to be the best parent that you can be, you, you better do everything in your power to be the best parent that you could be. You do everything in your power to be the best friend that you could be. You do everything in your power to be the best child that you can be to your parent, regardless of your age. Whatever it is, you be you do it to be the best student that you can be. So when it comes to me, um, learning, I love learning. And it's very important because it allows me to be able to be trained in righteousness. As I learn things, God is teaching me how to be humble. God is teaching me how to be righteous. He's also teaching me how to engage and interact with other people who are, excuse me, always defeated on a daily basis. Because see, when you used to obstacles, you they they don't become they don't become an obstacle really it's like oh okay well i can only focus on solutions i i can't focus on the obstacle it's no way like who focuses on the obstacle well there's a lot of people that do but i can't because there's been too many of them it's like some people will try to hinder you from a promotion. 
People will hinder you from all sorts of things. And I don't want to go into the depths of that right now. So I'm going to tell you how much the word of God and the teaching of God allows you to just be an overcomer and be more than a conqueror. So you need to be receptive, embrace correction, embrace being trained in righteousness, okay? And try to incorporate everything that you learn in the world. Make sure you include in the spiritual aspect of it. So what I mean is like, okay, I obtained those two uh, software engineering certificates yesterday, right? But what type of job am I going to take with that? Because see, the job with those certificates and the already existing certificates that I have in the education level, it could promote me into different areas that, you know, may not be good for the environment, right? Because technology is headed in a different way. And a lot of people are not symmetry with the way technology is growing. So we have to look at that too, you see? And um, so that's what I'm looking at. I want to do something that is not in contrary to what the word of God is saying and what the word of God wants us to do. So when you're learning things in this world, incorporate the spiritual aspects and keep God included in that. Keep God included in your job and, and pay attention to this scripture. This scripture really mean a lot. So you need to be able to embrace correction. And let God train you in righteousness for every single thing that you learn. Just be willing to embrace it. So I'm embracing that I have an accountability agent now because now, guess what? I have to stick to what my goals are. Whatever I tell her, I know that that's what that that's stuck in my head now. That's what I have to get done. Okay. So uh, next is now wisdom is divided into two parts. It is one, having a great deal to say and be not saying it. So now let me explain this. When you have a great deal to say about something, that means you're you're being a contributor, contributor, okay? When you see things and you don't say anything about it, that means that you're not contributing. So you want to be a contributor to society. You don't want to be a consumer. So now, do some people talk too much? Yes, absolutely, right? But people that talk a lot, sometimes you have to understand this. You can know what you can expect. than someone that doesn't say anything at all. So for me, my analogy, my analysis, I'm not going to say analogy because I don't want to give an example. My analysis is, Individuals that are very quiet, they are some of the most dangerous people on the world in the world. And I'm saying that again. People that are extremely quiet, they are some of the most dangerous people in the world. That's from my experience. The most dangerous. Okay, so it, it is very important now. Like now, I, I'm gonna, I am going to use an analogy here. Okay, you take the presidents of the United States, the current and previous presidents. Now you look at the presidents who talk too much. Well, you can know, you can anticipate what you can expect from them. So you can set expectations on how they're, what they're going to do. A president that's extremely quiet, right? They just, cause see, I was talking about this to somebody. Usually presidents have advisors. And so let me go on a little bit, a uh, little micro uh, explanation here. The presidents have advisors and so advisors usually create like uh speeches for presidents and also politicians so when they have an advisor they sometimes do have an advisory committee too so the advisory committee will all sit around in the board 
and then they'll figure out ways of what the president should say and how he's gonna, you know, read it off the prompt. And they are the ones who basically are making suggestions for the country. So for me, the president's advisory team are some of the most important people in office. And I know that a lot of times people like kind of look over an advisor, but the advisory team are the ones who are influencing the president, including the spouse of the president. So there is no way that a spouse doesn't influence the, the, the other spouse. So all spouses influence each other. And your advisors also influence you. Like my advisor in school, I have to sit here and I listen to my advisor. Like there were times where I didn't agree with my advisor, but I still did what he said. Because see, he's a professional. He's a specialist. I'm not yet, right? And in order for me to get to where he is, I need to listen to him because he is the expert. I am not. So when I am discussing certain things, yes, I do want an explanation. But ultimately, I am going to listen to what he says. At the end of the day, when it comes to my work, I am going to make sure that this work is within guidelines of as to what he says it's supposed to be because he is the expert. I am not. So you, we have to understand that there is checks and balances that need to be maintained. And these sort of checks and balances is understanding everything holistically and being able to analyze different perspectives in every single angle. So people that have a great deal to say, you can anticipate that they may do something that's unexpectedly. Excuse me. Or... The people that don't have a lot to say, you, you don't know what they're saying we're going to do. So you have presidents who really don't talk too much. They just passing bills behind the scene and signing over things that is sent from Congress. Because Congress makes the laws. The president signs and vetoes the laws. So Congress is the most powerful uh, government in, in the country. The president do not make the laws. The con Congress makes the laws. The president passes the bill. He signs off or either veto it. Okay. So many politicians have now finally, it's sort of synchronized in their mind that Congress is the most powerful position in the country if you're working in Congress. And so many of them, they, you have to analyze the things that they say because God says in the word, it's what's in your heart spoken out of your mouth that defile a man. So the things that they say actually is in a heart. So if they, you have people that are talking about, oh, well, we're going to take out the critical race theory and, and take out um, black history out of the school because this is teaching people how to go against government. Well, why are they looking at it from a negative perspective? That means that they have hidden things in their heart that they don't want anyone to be in opposition of, of their motives. Because if, you, if you're if you not really doing anything wrong, what's the problem, you know? So what's the problem with, what's the problem with having them learn about education? <laughs> What's wrong with them on the learn about the they history? That is just really that shows right there that I was a trusty baby of a slave owner. You can't tell me it's not. You it, I I bet you that I could prove genealogy that the individuals who sit there, the, the it's a couple different Congress members who have said. The take out critical race, and I'm talking about the Caucasian ones. And now they don't teach Black African American history anymore for civil rights in schools. It's banned in in the United States. So that sounds like they are or have come from. I mean, I could predict. 
because when you look at predictive models, you can kind of predict what the, you know, that person right there has to come from a family member of slave owners. They have to have some genealogy somewhere in there that come from slave owners. You're not going to have a mentality like that to just try to completely abolish civil rights from schools. Martin Luther King is no longer being taught, taught in, in our academic institutions. Any civil rights leaders are no longer being taught because the critical race theory has been banned. So those individuals that are Caucasian that have pushed this through, well, they use the black man to implement, propose the bill, but they are the ones who, you know, really had supported its practice. So like I said, individuals who are of that same race that go against their own race in ways that causes the race to become disadvantaged or underrepresented are individuals who pockets of bank accounts are being swollen up, increasing. So I bet you that there's a correlation between the individual who proposed the bill to eradicate critical race theory. There's a correlation with his, his bank account somewhere is being um, increased. I'm sure that there is a correlation, either direct or indirect correlation, either with him or other people that he know. Somebody is getting paid for him to cause his race to become disadvantaged. It is either him or the people we know is getting paid. And I, I am predicting that. Okay, because that's, that's like a predictive model. What other reasons would you um, sort of cause your race to become disadvantaged while promoting the activities of oppression within another race? So you have to question everything, okay? So pay attention at understanding that wisdom is divided into two parts, having a great deal to say and having and not and not saying it. So you you have all of these things, but you don't you don't choose to say anything about it. Why? Why why don't you want to participate? Why are you not saying anything to your family members that you see are racist? or your friends that you see are, you know, employing acts of racism or in inequity or inequality. Why are you not saying anything? But you see it. Okay, same way in the minority community. Why are you not saying anything when you see your people sitting back and just having poverty mentalities? You're not saying anything about it. Oh, I don't know. Uh-uh, I'm, I'm just letting them give me all the free money because free money is good. I, I'm not about to lose my apartment for getting no uh, job. Mm -hmm. Poverty mentality, right? So we have to do, we have to do things and have intervention there it is. So Freer's uh, pedagogy of the oppressed, you know, it, we are continuing to have oppression narratives. But what about the intervention narratives? Not just from individuals that are racist, but what about from in minority communities and marginalized communities where there are so many underrepresented people? What are you doing in order to help, um, in order to help uh, combating your neighborhoods from having poverty mentalities? Because that, that was genetically inherited. And it wasn't, I am not talking about through genes. I'm saying it was inherited. Poverty was inherited. The mentality of poverty was inherited. So what are you doing to dismantle that? Or are you becoming like the wealthy people that you see all the time? So um, let me continue. So there is no instruction manual regarding life. 
Accountability is a principle according to which a person or institution is responsible for a set of duties and can be required to give an account of their fulfillment to an authority that is in position to issue rewards and punishment. So when we allow God to, we allow ourselves to be accountable with God. That means we are becoming vulnerable to God. You have allowed yourself to be vulnerable to God in such a way that when, you, when you're being corrected, you accept it. Now, sometimes you may reject the correction. I mean, like I was really rejecting correct accountability. I don't know who do I need to be accountable? Who got to be accountable? Uh, I think I'm responsible. <laughs> literally you know like i talk to god i pray i pay my bills i help people i maintain everything for my kids for the lump forever you know so like what this doesn't make what who talking to who want to help me the well like god is the only one to help me that's the way i was feeling so god want me to congregate he want, you know, me to just be open a little more. I've been this way a long time. So it's it's good for me to be transparent and allow God to do what he needs to do in my life. Okay, it's the same way with you. You have to be transparent. Okay, and allow God to, you know, make you accountable for your actions. So be accountable. Be accountable. You be accountable when you become vulnerable to God. God will use a number of different people because the scripture, the word of God is God breathed. That means that God was, God used all the authors. All of the authors of the Holy Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit. God breathed. You understand? And so this is really important to understand accountability. So I have posted the actual Britannica uh, accountability mainly. So being accountable for your choices and decision creates opportunities for you to learn and unlearn behavior that may have prevented you from successfully flourishing in life. So your autonomy, your deontology, morals, religion, Scientology, atheism, and some excuses will lead to defeat, which is all distinct perspectives that drive human behavior. Okay. So you have to understand that God wants us to learn new things. But unlearn the the things that that we don't need to have and, and know anymore. Okay, so unlearn behavior. So how do you unlearn behavior? Well, I unlearn how to quit smoking. You know, a habit as such as smoking is so hard to detach. It was so difficult. You know. But when you think about it, like when I thought about it, I say, okay, well, God, I did not smoke when I was pregnant. I mean, but that's so long ago. I have four kids that I delivered, you know? And so when I think about that, it's like, okay, well, I didn't smoke though. You know, so what was so hard about me stopping smoking? And so God has, this what God revealed to me. Anything that controls you is witchcraft. So I'm going to say that again. Anything that controls you is a form of witchcraft. And so God, God doesn't control you. God gives you freedom of choice. So if your choice and your decision leads to you being controlled, then you need to unlearn that behavior. Because, see, God wants your heart to be so clean and pure that every single decision that you're making is voluntary. 
So you are not being controlled. You are not being controlled. You are not being controlled in your friendships, in your relationships with your family. You're not being controlled. God does not control people. So if you are smoking and you have an addiction, that means that the addiction is controlling you. And that's the form of witchcraft. That means that the evil, because you see it's evil that is attached to control. Okay, so it's like when you choose a wife, if you have to control her, do you think you made the right decision? Because a, a virtuous wife is not going to have to be controlled. So like um, in my uh, previous marriage, right, I've never actually had a problem with a man staying with me or like staying married to me. I am the one who initiate divorce. So what does that mean? It means that a wife is supposed to be so loving and so much, so caring that that husband will never, ever, ever divorce. No matter what. You don't have to be controlled. You don't, you don't entertain other men. You don't entertain. Like when you, when I used to look at another man, I'm looking at his shoes and like, oh, them shoes will look so nice on my husband. Where did you get them from? They don't look so nice on my husband. <laughs> that's, that's the way I will talk. You know, and I meant, I meant that. So in certain things, it's like, okay, you don't have an attachment to certain, certain things that will um, lead you to having a controlling relationship. So anything that controls you is uh it's like it's evil because you don't have the freedom. Because like when you love God, God isn't forcing you to love him. It's voluntary. God don't force you to read the Bible. That's voluntary too. God don't force you to be obedient. That's voluntary too. God don't force you to pray because that's voluntary too. So I, I've realized that if God doesn't force you to do these things, why do people place these stipulations of force and control? Because when you read the word, anything that controls you is witchcraft. So don't be controlled. Like if you're going to be a virtuous, faithful wife, you're going to be a virtuous, faithful wife. If you're going to be a loving, caring husband, you're going to treat your wife as you treat your own body. That's what you're going to do. You're not going to have to be concerned about my wife going to the store with heels on and all these men going to be looking at her. Why would you need to be concerned about something so meaningless? No, you would know that you have a faithful wife who is a virtuous woman. And another man isn't something that her eyes are going to be set on. So you trust her, right? Because when you are married, the two become one. So that literally, you don't distrust yourself, right? Okay. So you got to have spiritual wisdom here. All right. So that's, that's, ooh. Oh, Lord, time is just really going by so fast, God. Okay, so um, I have not been able to go into autonomy or anything else. So I'm going to leave it right there. But try to understand that we have to learn how to unlearn behavior. Excuse me, because unlearning behavior is um something that is really important and i know uh oh that's that's another thing that i meant, meant to mention about the herbs and um the apple cider vinegar is really really good it's an inflammatory too i meant to mention that and so it helps it was really helpful with helping your dig digestive system 
So if you have like constipation or uh, problems in your stomach, you, you just drink some apple cider vinegar, the real raw unfiltered uh, apple cider vinegar. And you get into the habit of making, maybe taking two sips a day, or then you increase it to like maybe three or four. And so just continue to increase it because you could you could mix it with water or you could drink it straight. The apple cider vinegar is really good. But it do like, I keep uh, burping. And so it do cause you to burp, <laughs> but I'm so used to taking it, but it's really, um, it's really helpful to make sure that your digestive system is up to par. So I wanted to um, just touch base on that. Now, uh, learning and unlearning behavior, we have to remember that all behavior is not good behavior. So you just have to be able to identify which behavior isn't working right with God. So you have to say, well, what would Jesus do? Is this okay for me to do that? And you have to allow the conviction of the Holy Spirit to be in your heart. So you want the Holy Spirit to convict you of things like when I was smoking, I, I was feeling convicted, like, oh, I'm defiling my body. Right? And then, like, it was just, you know, God has given me power, right? So you just have to know the place, know your position, and understand the power that God is with, that God has given you. Understand the power that is within you, because you have power in you. So you have to use that power that God has given you to be able to learn righteousness and unlearn behavior that disallowed you from being righteous. And it starts with letting go of control. Letting go of the things that have controlled you. Because if you are being controlled by just the comments of other people, that, that's a, the form of control. You are being, your decisions are influenced by what people think. By what you think other people think or what people say about you. How is that helpful? Like when my uncle asked me why, he said, why you ain't tell me when you graduated? I said, well, it was just an accomplishment. You know, it wasn't like I was talking to you on a regular basis. I didn't go around like, oh, I just grad I graduated. I got to not go doing all of that because it wasn't for the satisfaction of other people. It was for me being able to accomplish another step closer to the goal that God has for my life, and that's benevolence. So that's the goal that I felt satisfied with just having with the Lord. Me and God, I felt I still did a celebration. I was up in here. I was at home jumping up and down, listening to my music, and so I was so happy. You know, so it, it's just, you know, what motivates you? What motivates your behavior? You want to analyze that and make sure that it's, it's in alignment with God and what God has planned for you. Okay, so tomorrow I'm going to continue on autonomy, uh, deontology, morals, religion, Scientology, atheism. And uh, I, I did want to include Buddhism. And I am also going to include the matrix, which I believe has to do with like the sixth dimension because they have like dimensions. Well, that that's the whole, that's, I don't know if that should go by itself. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to include all that. I'm going to include the Buddhism. I'm going to include the uh, matrix, which like is like a parallel correlation between the uh, um dimensions because it's like one, dimensions one through three and then you have dimensions four through six and, and so they have all these different perspectives on the earth and the world going into the sixth dimension and this is with the because of the mandela effect but now instead of calling it the mandela effect they are calling it the matrix so Huh, that is just so much information, but I am fully aware of all of this. So I think it'll be an interesting discussion. And like I said, I want you all to get 
involved, get acclimated to coming online with me. Okay. And if you want to come into the Zoom, I posted the Zoom link on suddenchangescorporation.org and um, send me an email. Okay. And remember to share the page. Share, share, share. All right, so let me go ahead and end it for tonight. Let me go ahead and pray. All right. Father God, I just come boldly before your throne. Thank you so much for just teaching us. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for just being in our life and loving us. Thank you for allowing us to become vulnerable to you. Thank you for keeping our hearts soft and enough and melted for you, God, so that we will be vulnerable to you, that we will submit our will to you. And so we appreciate it, God, and we submit our wills to you. We submit ourselves to you, God. We are bound to you. And we appreciate it. We appreciate the love that you have for us. We appreciate being able to give you thanks, God. We appreciate all the gifts that we have received, God. Thank you for guiding us continually. We appreciate it. And God, we just, we want show will to be done in our life. So we ask that you continue to open up doors in our life that no man can close. Let our satisfaction and our identity and confidence that is empowered by the motivation that we have, let it be attached to you and you only. Let our identity be in you, God, and not, in, not attached to what other people think or say or attached to any socioeconomic status. But God, let our identity and our confidence and motivation come from you because we appreciate you, God, and we know that your plans is better than ours. God, if we want the best for ourselves, we know that our plan, it doesn't even equal up to a portion of the plans that you have for us. And so we appreciate the plans that you have for us. So we ask that you allow your plan and your will and your purpose to be fulfilled in our life. So we cancel every assignment of the enemy, every tongue that accuses us and judgment is condemned. We redeem your assignment upon our life. We thank you that we walk in your will, your plan, and your purpose. In the name of Jesus Christ, it is sealed in your blood. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much for joining me. I will see you all tomorrow. You have a good night. Thank you. What is this? Oh, I'm still on here now. <laughs>